Well, before we get started, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, for us to be able to look at your word, which has been preserved over the ages for our benefit. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us of what you've done by taking of this communion, this thing by which we are commonly united because your blood has been shed for our sin. We thank you, Lord, that as imperfect and as flawed as we are, that you promise that if we come to you, that you'll make us new and that you'll direct us and walk with us through this life. And we're grateful for that. We pray, Lord, that you might help us this morning, that we might wrap our mind around the things instructed to us by your word and through your Holy Spirit. We pray that you might help us to learn to be like you in every way. And today that we would be warned of the tendency of our own hearts to go astray, that you might help us to give attention to your word, and the things that you've done, and to the things that you speak to our hearts. Lord, you know we walk through a dirty world and we need our feet washed periodically. Pray that it might be that for, the, for us this morning, that you might renew us and make us like you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, this morning we're going to go into Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. It talks about false teachers. Remember, Peter writing the, the second epistle of Peter, the end of his life. So he's an old man writing from a cell, and it's not, it's not too far from the time he writes this to where he's taken outside of Rome and crucified upside down. And so this is Peter's last word to us. And uh, just like if you were on your deathbed or you knew that your end was coming, there are things you want to pass on. There are things that you don't want to neglect. There are people you want to understand things before you leave. And I think that's certainly the, the flavor and, and the, the vibe of Second Peter, where he's trying to just hand off. We saw in chapter one, where he talks about who we are in Christ and how we are to lay hold of the promises that God has made for us. In fact, there are some promises that if you do these things, you will never stumble. And so there are some really awesome things in the category of who we are in Christ Jesus in chapter one. So Peter reminds them of that. He's going to go to chapter two, which is going to take a very dark turn. And he's going to warn people about false teachers and about people in the history of Israel who have come and been false teachers and led the people astray and that there will be false teachers even now in the church. So Peter is going to take a very heavy warning and we're going to see that the book of Jude parallels this chapter extremely well. And I'll show you how that works. Jude is only one chapter. So if you're looking for like a quick devotional, it's not light reading though. It's very heavy. So beginning in second Peter uh, verse 12, it says, but these like brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things and they do not understand, and they will utterly perish in their own corruption. And so this is a warning to false teachers. And it's uh, interesting where false teachers come from. Many of them come from within the church. If you know anything about the cults, uh, those who disregard the sacrifice of Jesus, or they disregard the deity of Jesus Christ, they, um, they come out of Christian backgrounds. I think of any number of people, even in Hollywood, who have struck it big, and they came out of the church, and yet their lives took such a turn that evidence that they were definitely not of us, uh, they, were, they were never of us. And so we're going to take a look at this in chapter two, and I have a new clicker. Let's see if it works. I know there are some technical people that love me chapter two, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves 
swift destruction. So Peter introducing, if you remember previously, he says, no scripture is of any personal interpretation. And that there were those who were moved along by the Holy Spirit to write the things that are written. And now he's going to say, there are going to be false teachers among you. There always have been, and there always will be, which means there are today still false teachers within the church. How many of you understand that's true? Yeah. And you still come here? <laughs> false teachers. So this is a, a very heavy warning from Peter that there are those who are going to propagate things that are not found in the scripture. They're going to either add to it or take away from it. Jesus calls them wolves in sheep's clothing where they come and you can always, you can always tell by their fruit, you know, the things that come out of their lives. Uh, wolves devour sheep. Shepherds feed sheep. They defend the sheep. It's a very different thing. And so you can always tell something by what it eats. <laughs> sheep don't eat other sheep. They eat grass. Jesus tells another parable about how there will be tares among the wheat. Tares are basically wheat-looking weeds that don't bear fruit. And Jesus tells the parable of how a sower went and sowed good seed. And he put these, this seed down into the ground and there were tares that were coming up among the wheat. And so the laborers said, Lord, there's, there's weeds in your wheat. How did this happen? And he goes, an enemy has done this. It's rather curious. Let them grow up together. Because they said, do you want us to pull them out? And, no, no, if you pull them up, you're going to disturb, you know, the wheat. So let them grow up together, which is an interesting way of looking at things. And when it was all done and they took the harvest, they gathered the wheat into the barn and the, the weeds were cut down and thrown into the fire. And so Jesus very clearly talking about those who did not bear fruit, those who were not his, who didn't follow him. And the good seed that was planted was from him. So there are tares among the wheat. And we're told that that's the case from Jesus himself and also from Peter giving us this warning. They secretly bring in destructive heresies. You know, if the devil were to show up with horns and a tail looking like a half animal, you know, angry, red, like most people characterize him, it would be very easily seen. But there are people who come in and they will plant the seeds of doubt and begin sowing heresy. And it doesn't, they don't look that way. They don't look like the devil, but you know who they're working for, because all you have to do is listen to what they say. Heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, there's a difficult passage. So the Lord bought them. It, it sounds like they belong to him. And yet they're sowing heresies. Just something for you to wrestle with in your private devotions and your time of study. <laughs> Even denying the Lord who bought them. So there, there are those who will come from the church and Jesus even says those who went out from us, they went out from us to show that they were not of us. And so that's what I believe it is. They've associated with the church, but they are not associated with Christ necessarily. And he says that there is swift destruction that is coming. If, if you're going to be somebody who sows heresy, it's going to be something where the Lord is on you and he will make sure that it gets stopped. Um, I want to be very careful about whatever it is that I say up here or to anybody because I want it to be accurate and right because I don't want to make an enemy of the one whom I've given myself to or supposedly given myself to. Matthew 7.15, Jesus says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Matthew 24 and verse 11 and 24, he says, there are many false prophets will rise and deceive many. He's speaking of the end times in chapter 24. And he says in verse 24, for the false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So there are going to be those who come with miracles, signs and wonders, and there will be preaching heresy. Well, how can that be? Well, there are two great spiritual powers in this world, right? One is from God and one is from the devil. 
And so can the devil do miracles? Oh, yeah, he can. Can his followers do miracles? Oh, yeah, they can. Oh, Pastor Dave, I went to somebody and they read my palm and they told me exactly what was going to happen in the future. Do you think that was God? Do you think that's somebody trying to get a follower? <laughs> yeah, I think that's somebody trying to get a follower. And so it happens. First John 4, 1, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So over and over and over, the scriptures tell us to be careful. And there are many other passages. And just for, for time, just take my word for it. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad you're with me. I don't know, Pastor. We're going to go home and check that out. Good. I hope you do. Therefore, in Acts chapter 20, when Paul is saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders, he's going away and he's saying goodbye to them. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among you, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Notice it's not making followers of Jesus Christ. It's making followers of themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for these three years, they did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now, if the apostle Paul said, for three years, I've been with you and I've warned you night and day with tears, I imagine it's pretty important to be on guard, to know what the scripture says and not buy into whatever flavor of the month happens to be happening around us, right? And I understand the purpose of that is to take my legs out from under me so I don't walk in Christ. So I won't let that happen. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. I'm just throwing a few suggestions up here, guys. All you have to do is turn on the TV. That's Benny Hinn, if you don't know who he is. He's been convicted of uh, ripping people off. They do all sorts of interesting things. They get little wireless devices in their ear and have people tell them information about the people that are there at their crusades and they, all these healings that occur. And a lot of it is just entertainment, unfortunately. You have a man named Jimmy Swaggart, who I used to follow when I was a young Christian. He spoke really good uh, about the word of God. And then he was found. And the, and the thing that he was really big on was sexual immorality. And I remember as a young Christian, I was like mortified, you know, oh my goodness. Yeah, I got lust in my heart. Oh no. You know, and Jimmy Swagger <laughs> was hammering people, yelling and screaming in their face. And it turns out that's his biggest problem. Yeah. He's hiring prostitutes and everything else. You've got Jim and Tammy Baker, uh, which you know, uh, and Jessica Hahn, who he cheated on his wife with. Uh, she's the church secretary, 20 years old. And, um, I mean, the whole world makes fun of things like this. And because of people like this, the way of God is mocked. Oh, you're one of those Christians. You mean like these guys? Oh, yeah, I see them on a the TV all the time. and make, It's hilarious. You know, and it's just great fertile soil for the world to mock the God that we know and love and the Jesus that we've received as a Savior, which is a, it's a disgusting and horrible thing. It, you got this guy which worships money. I, I saw him last night. I watched hours of, two, uh, of these clowns. I don't mind saying that. These clowns. Guy got down on the stage, took money out of his pocket, and laid it on the stage, and he bowed down to it and put his forehead on it. In a giant Christian, you know, coliseum of people. He said, I want to roll around in green, the green pastures. Yeah, taking the scriptures and twisting them up. So, in the most eloquent way that I can say, it's messed up. These people are messed up. 
Don't you wish I was either an angry or a handsome preacher? <laughs> Listen, there are people that preach all sorts of stuff, and I think probably one of the most devastating things, and especially in other countries, not so much in America because people swallow this stuff, is the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel of all you have to do is accept Jesus and he'll make you rich. If you're not rich, there's something wrong with you. It's, you, you don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith and you demanded of God that he make you rich, he'd make you rich. Really? Amen. I got riches that can't be counted in the bank. I got eternity. And I imagine you do as well with Jesus. But people turn this all into a, a, a money thing. And whenever you get there, and it's one of the reasons I never will talk about money. Unless it's, unless it's in the scripture that we're talking about. I will not hammer people like, you know, our giving's been a little light, people. We're going to pass buckets around, and then we're going to pass them around a second time. And if there's not enough money, we'll send it around a third time. Do you understand the reason for their existence is to use you like merchandise? That's how you can tell a wolf, because the wolf eats sheep. God help us, we never go that way. So... You got people with crazy hairdos, <laughs> which is why people watch them, I think, sometimes. But I'll tell you what, Saturday Night Live has a great time with all of these people who profess Christianity. And this is what your friends, your relatives, people that you know, think about Jesus. They think, oh, you're one of those. No, we're not one of those. But the way of truth is blasphemed because what they see on TV is this. It, you don't see that here. You don't see that here. I hope that people when they come here see the love of Jesus Christ for a soul, not what they can get out of somebody, but what they can do for somebody. It's a very different thing. False truth brings confusion and degrades the image of God in the eyes of people. It always does. And so I want to make sure I do my best never to fall in line with this or give anybody the idea or even the slightest fragrance that there's anything like that going on here. And part of the problem is there's no accountability. That's part of the problem, why these guys get away with it. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has, been, has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. Uh, that's another way for the Bible to say theirs is coming. Their judgment is on the way. In Luke 8, uh, 18, 8, it says, I will tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? It's a very curious statement that Jesus says because there was a lack of faith when he was there. And he goes, you know, when the Son of Man comes again in his glory with his glorious angels and he separates the sheep from the goats, Will he find faith on the earth? Because Christianity has been so watered down and so messed up for so long. You wonder, how could anybody be saved when they hear the message on TV that these people are preaching? And yet, God knows whose are his. And God's in control. In Jude chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he puts it this way. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. By the way, that's a wrestling term. It, it means that you fight. I found it necessary to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. A reporter went up to uh, this gentleman on the screen and, and asked him why he needs three jets to conduct his ministry. And you would not believe the satanic stuff that came flying out of his mouth as he laid into her. And then he smiled like uh, it was all a performance, but it wasn't. 
lewdness. In other words, do whatever you want to do. That's lewdness, okay? It's, it's, it's like rudeness, but it's cruder. <laughs> when people are obsessed with money and power and fame, big mistake. Stay away from them. Don't have anything to do with them. And it's interesting because even the devil knows the scriptures, doesn't he? And he came to Jesus and tempted him with the scriptures, trying to misapply them and misinterpret them. So just because there's scripture, it doesn't necessarily mean it's used rightly. You know, just because somebody has an ax doesn't necessarily mean they're chopping wood. They might be coming for you. Verse four, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those afterward who would live ungodly and delivered righteous lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeking and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Now there's a lot there, people. Basically, he's saying, look at what God has done in the past. Those who are evil, he knows how to punish. And those who are not, he knows how to deliver right? And he gives us all of these examples. I hope that these are, you know, the, the God did not spare the angels who sinned, the angels who sinned. Well, there's a couple of uh, different things that the commentators say this could be. It could be a third of the angels that fell, which are described in the book of Revelation. When Satan himself fell, we understand that a third of the angels fell with him. It could be that. But it's interesting because it says the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell. I don't know about you, but those those evil ones are running around here tempting people and doing stuff. So he didn't lock them down in hell. So who's locked down in hell? You know, there are certain angels that the Lord locked down because they overstepped their bounds. If you look in Genesis chapter 6, you'll see that the, that the sons of God, uh, the Bene Elohim, which are the sons of God, which always means angels. It's mentioned three other times in scripture. It's always angels. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair and they took any of them that they wanted. And then they produced these giants, it says, which is somewhat of an unfortunate, um, anyway, it's the Nephilim. It means the fallen ones. These were produced and I believe those angels were knocked down and the Lord put them in special prison. So they're locked up waiting for judgment where the other angels are still free to roam around, the, the fallen angels. But these, he locked down in hell. Uh, actually, the, the word is not hell, it's Tartarus, which is uh, only found here in the scriptures, by the way. It's a kind of a compartment. It's a compartment of waiting. Uh, so that's Tartarus or hell and delivered into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So they're in jail and I'm glad. And he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. It's interesting. It doesn't say anywhere in the Old Testament that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Did you know Noah was a preacher? No. For 120 years, he preached. He preached as he built a boat. Yep, you better cut it out, guys. It's going to rain. Rain. What the heck is that? You're building in the... You're not even near a body of water. What are you doing here? You watch for 120 years and he wouldn't listen. And God preserved Noah, picked him up, took him away. He and those who were with him. A preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction by making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly. You see, God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember when he sent the three to Abraham and the two ended up going off over to Sodom and one remained behind and he called him Lord. And he says, shall we not tell Abraham what we're about to do? He's going to be a mighty nation. 
It's going to have a lot of descendants. I think this could be a good, good thing. And he says, by the way, those two guys, they're going to see whether it's as bad as we understand it to be. They're going to investigate. It's interesting. You always find two witnesses. In Revelation, there are two witnesses. In the Mount of Transfiguration, there are two witnesses. It's an interesting theme. You might want to take a look at that. Anyway, so they're... They take off and they go in, and of course, Abraham's concerned because his nephew Lot is there, and he goes, well, wait a minute. If, there are, if there's 50 righteous people in the city, you wouldn't destroy the city for 50 righteous, would you? He goes, no, I wouldn't destroy the city for 50 righteous. Of course not. Well, what about 40? And what about half that? What about 10? Would you destroy the city for 10 people? For 10 people? And the Lord says, for 10 people, I would not destroy the city. You get the idea that Abraham could have gone further but he didn't. And I'm wondering, would the Lord save the city and not destroy it for one? Well, it ends up that the only three that get out are Lot and his two daughters. And I wouldn't say that they were exactly stellar, um, you know, examples of perfection. Uh, certainly the rest of their lives demonstrate that. But God knows how to punish those who are evil and he knows how to rescue those who are his. And so I take encouragement actually from this scripture that those who are these false teachers, they're not going to proliferate forever. They're going to get busted. You're going to get caught. God's going to bring judgment. And certainly if we don't see it here in this plane, it's going to happen on the next when we stand before the Lord. And he says, if that's the case and we understand all of this, how he rescued Lot, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Amen. God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So God knows what he's doing. He's in control and he's sovereign over these things. I'm good with that. But sometimes I hear these guys, I was listening to uh, thing after thing last night of all these false teachers and I started getting mad. You guys know anger? You know what that's, you know, like burning fire thing? Uh, you, you guys are just need to give you a coffee in the morning. I got mad. I, I, when that guy pulled out money and put it on the carpet and, and put his head down on it and bowed down to it and said, yes, these are the green pastures. Ew. Yeah. It's disgusting to take the word of God and, and turn it to lewdness. Anyway. He delivers and dispatches. And we can thank God that he does. Verse 10 and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might and do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. Peter knows how to put some words together, doesn't he? Spiritually inspired. Well, especially, especially, which means at, at the top of the list of things you don't want to see in a teacher is sexual immorality which how many pastors, how many shepherds have been taken in by that? I mean, I, 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 can, I can count them on two hands. I shouldn't be able to count any. According to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness, by the way, that's sexual uncleanness. Jude puts it a little differently. He says, likewise, also, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Notice he has the same categories. Yet, Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses dared not bring against him a reviling accusation but said the Lord rebuke you. These speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally like brute beasts in these things they corrupt themselves. You notice how similar these passages are? If you look at them side by side it's an amazing thing how similar they are. And it's about those who are sexually immoral, number one, and those who reject authority. Now, I know you people have been cleansed of your flesh, and you have absolutely no problem with any of this. 
Sexual temptation is huge in our, in our society today. And rejection of authority. I don't have to do any, I don't have to submit, I don't have to pay taxes. What do you think of that? I don't have to, and pastor, I don't have to listen to you either. And it, wow, good luck with your kids. No, they're going to listen to me. Oh, no, they won't. Because if you have no regard for authority, neither will they. People don't see that until it's too late. But these dreamers, they defile the flesh. And those are the things that you look out for is this, the lust of uncleanness, sexual uncleanness, promiscuity, and despising authority. Presumptuous, to think that you can continue to live in a particular way and God will be gracious. You know, I can just do whatever I want to do and it's okay. God's forgiven me. You know, and even some people say, well, I'm a Christian. I got my golden ticket and I could do whatever I want now. And they presume upon the grace of God. And yet, if he really loves you, he'll discipline you. And you're not getting away with anything. You just aren't. So these dreamers defile, they reject authority, and they speak evil of dignitaries. And then we're, we're told by Jude some more information about these angels that don't speak evil of dignitaries. By the way, they're talking about evil spirits and the like. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses. Any of you read that in the Old Testament? No, because it's not there. It's interesting. There are a few things here in the New Testament that are revelatory about the Old Testament that aren't even in the Old Testament. Isn't that curious? Did you know that Michael, the archangel, fought with the devil over the body of Moses? And what in the world would he do with the body of Moses anyway? These are mysterious things. It makes you go, hmm, that's right. I love the fact that you guys are responsive when I do that. You remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, there was Elijah and Moses. Very interesting. And then we see in Revelation, the two witnesses that come, they do all of the same sort of miracles that Elijah and Moses do. Elijah had an unnatural death, didn't he? The Lord came and took him. Moses, though he died, and it says in the, in the law that God buried him, we understand that there was a battle over his body. I imagine they could have taken his body and made it an object of worship too, which the devil would love. You know, like relics. Did you know that all the churches, all the Catholic churches, at least, that were established by the Catholic church in Europe, there was not a church able to be built unless there was a relic like a piece of the cross, a piece of Noah's Ark, the skull of John the Baptist, or of Mary Magdalene, or a finger bone, I love that, just a little finger bone of a saint. And so none of these churches could be established unless they had a relic, and that's what made it special. We have a tendency to make idols of things that God never intended to make idols. And I think that's, that may be also what it is, but you guys can argue with Sean about that later. <laughs> Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring any reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. He says that these false teachers act like they're authorities over demons and devils and that they have more power than them. And they treat them with disrespect. Could that be? I heard one of these guys yesterday say, I love to tear the devil up. I cut him up. I cut him up like this. What? It says that Michael the archangel, by the way, Michael the archangel is no, nobody to play with. He kills 185,000 Syrians in one night. You don't want to play with this guy. I think he's the one that comes and he changed the devil ultimately. And it says one angel will chain him up. I think it's Michael. And I think he's going to enjoy that. So you, imagine a fallen angel. Imagine Lucifer or the devil. Do you think that you can beat him? Absolutely not. Not without Jesus. An angel, an angel knew that. And Michael said, listen, the Lord rebuke you. You see, 
there's a respect that you better have for these fallen creatures. And don't think that you can just go slap, cutting them up, slapping them around. You have absolutely no respect for God's created order if you do that. And so I look for that in a false teacher too, because it says that's what false teachers do. They act like they're, they're the end all be all of power. God help you. The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts and these things, they corrupt themselves. You see, these are people in the flesh. And when they talk about spiritual things, their imagination goes wild. Watch out for those folks. If it's not rooted in scriptures and if you don't see a reverence for God's created order, it's, it's a big mess. Make sense? I'm trying to equip you guys. I mean, you can usually see them, you can usually find them because they have a southern accent. I don't know why. <laughs> Devil! I'm going, you know, I don't know why. It just seems they all come from down south somewhere. They will receive the wages of unrighteousness and those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. By the way, they walk around with lusty eyes all day long. They are spots and blemishes, by the way. It's a way of speaking of cancer, isn't it? It's also used in boating when there's a rock that's just below the surface and you can't see it. It's uh, this danger that you're coming upon. And these are spots and blemishes causing in, the, in their own deceptions, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. So they act, they act like your friend when they're with you, but they're trying to figure out how they're going to use you. Enticing, unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices. Does that sound weird? These people are trained at covetous practices, like a telemarketer. Or like somebody that tries to pick you up in the bar on a Friday night. Hey, beautiful, where you been all my life? <laughs> it won't be that cheesy. These people are slick and they know how to sell you and they know how to take you in. They know how to set the hook and reel you. Having eyes full of adultery, they cannot cease from sin. They can't because they're a slave to it. Enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are an accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray which tells me they were on the right way at some point. They have a context. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, speaking in a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. You guys remember him? Balaam. Balak went to him and said, listen, these Israelites are coming. There's millions of them. And they're coming to, through my land and, and I don't want them to take over. I don't even want them to pass through. I want them shut down. I figured I'd talk to you because you're God's hit man, right? I'm willing to pay you a lot of money. He goes, I'll be right back. And he goes and he says, hey, God, what do you think? He's going to pay me a lot of money to spit curses down on these people. And the Lord says, those are my people. Don't do it. And he goes back to Balak, or at least the messengers he sent. And he says, God said, no. And they go, oh, you want more money. Okay. And they sent more messengers and more money and they offered him again. And he goes back to the Lord a second time and says, hey, Lord, they're offering me more money. And the Lord said, okay, go ahead. But you're only going to say what I tell you. Now, listen, if God told you once, no. And he said, these are my people. Wouldn't that be enough for you? I get it. Sorry. Sorry I asked. I, I, I won't come back a second time. He goes back because the money went up. And the Lord lets him go. Well, the funny thing is he's on his way to, to do biddings. And uh, he's on a donkey. And the donkey does all these crazy things. Goes off road. Walks him into a cliff. And he scrapes his leg on the rocks. And, you know, then he just stops. And he won't move anywhere. And so basically the donkey says, listen, haven't I been a good donkey? Why are you beating on me? The reason I stopped is because there's a guy up in the road. Take a look. And he looks and there's an angel of the Lord 
with the sword drawn, ready to take his head off. <laughs> Michael, undoubtedly. It was because of this animal that he was saved. And this animal rebuked him. So, I don't know about you, but I, I certainly don't need animals talking to me before I'm going to be obedient to the things God's told me to do and not do, right? But the Lord will go to ex extremes at times to fix us and let us know exactly what he wants us to do. In Jude 11, it echoes this. He says, woe to them for they have gone the way of Cain and run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So he adds two more historical figures for us. One is Cain. You remember Cain looked at his brother, Abel. Abel was giving a sacrifice to God in the way God wanted it. And he wasn't, and his heart was far from God. And he was jealous of Abel and he killed him. So he says, these guys are going the way of Abel. It's like looking on the TV and finding some rich, famous preacher and saying, ah, that's what I want. I want to be like Joel Osteen. I want to just say nice words. So I'm going to do that. This whole church, we're going to turn it into a gigantic building and we're, we're going to have lots of parking and God's going to shower riches. I, I can't even say it because it hurts me. Sorry. No, because it's not about that. That just shows me you don't have enough. You mean Jesus isn't enough? You mean the Holy Spirit isn't enough? You mean the Word of God is not enough? You mean fellowship in Christ is not enough? Come on. I didn't teach Bible study on Thursday because everybody had to eat. And I missed the heck out of you guys. <laughs> Woe to them. They've gone the way of Cain and greedily run after the error of Balaam. That's for profit. And perished in the rebellion of Korah. If you remember the, in the wilderness and the book of Numbers talks about Korah who rises up against Moses and they speak evil. Him and 250 people, they speak evil of Moses and his leadership. And, you know, God separates them and the ground opens up and swallows them and fire comes down from heaven and devours them. And then there are a whole bunch of people that complain about what God did because they were on Korah's side because they were rebellious and, and the Lord sent the plague. Anyway. The rebellion of Korah is the non-submission to authority. So these two things, be careful of these two things, sexual immorality and a rejection of authority. Those are the two things that the scripture says. Ab above all things, these are the, you, you find a teacher who's in this realm, you need to run away. That's in Numbers chapter 16 about Korah, by the way. That was my little note. Verse 17 these, these false teachers, are wells without water. You know, I imagine you folks come here because you want to drink of the word of God. I imagine you folks come here because you see the love of Jesus Christ in his people. That is like a refreshing drink of water. That's the way it's supposed to be. These guys are wells without water. Clouds that are carried by a tempest of whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. By the way, forever is forever. It, it doesn't mean for a short period of time or that you get annihilated. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, I love that, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Notice target is you as a believer. Those who have escaped the error of the world, those who have been free of their bonds, those who are on the right side of the Red Sea, but on the wrong side of the Jordan, those people are ripe for the picking. He says they're like wells without water. They're clouds without rain. They're like trees that are dead and they're setting a trap. In Jude chapter one, verses 12 and 13, he says this, these are spots in your love feasts while they feast with you, with you without fear, serving only themselves. It's another characteristic of a false teacher. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit. Trees are supposed to bear fruit in the autumn, by the way. Twice dead, pulling up by, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, lots of noise, and, but no real substance foaming up to their own shame 
wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You know what a wandering star is? It's a comet. <laughs> the thing is on fire. But you see, it has no orbit. It's something that has no orbit and it's gone off on its own. There's the rejection of authority. So Jude is reiterating all the same things that Peter is saying here. Watch out for false teachers that don't have accountability and they're going off on their own. They're going to they're gonna be sexual in nature and they're going to be money and greed based and they're only going to serve themselves. They're not about serving other people. Make sense? Okay, these are all the, I hope you guys are checking these things off of your list. Jude verses 16 and 17 say, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. There's a difference between encouragement and flattery, right? To tell somebody that you're truly thankful for them because you're truly thankful for them, that's called encouragement. Seeing the work of God in somebody's life and telling them that is encouragement. Flattery is when you do it because you want to get something out of them. Make sense? You guys know the difference? My wife will come up to me and she'll need me to do something and she'll go, you're so handsome. <laughs> what do you want? But see, I know that's what she's doing and she knows that I know that's what she's doing. But it's when people actually come and try selling you some goods and you don't know what's going on in their heart and they begin to sow this flattery be careful of false teachers. They will flatter you to get something. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. And Jesus says, if you do not have the spirit, you are none of his. And he says that they cause divisions. They're sensual persons. They're based on feeling only. Feelings are a great caboose, but they're a terrible engine. Amen? Amen? Feelings are a great caboose, but they're a terrible engine. They won't always lead you in the right way. The word of God is the engine. My feelings will follow after. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. And they're complainers. They're grumblers. They always find something wrong. Watch out for these people. I think this falls asleep. Verse 19, while they promise them, the people who are following them, liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Can you imagine having a Christian background, being exposed to Christ, all of those things, and, you know, filing in and sitting down for a sermon and going out and grabbing food and, and being involved in all that and then falling for some deception and being led away? Your next condition is going to be worse than your first condition when you were delivered from those things. So that's why I have to hold fast to Jesus and say, Lord, hold on to me because I know the next step, I was pretty bad when Jesus found me. But if I step off and if I decide I'm going to go back and I'm going to buy into some of that junk, it's going to be worse. So I don't, I don't even look forward to that. I will be going from the frying pan to the fire. In Luke 11, Jesus explains to us some interesting facts about the spiritual world. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to the house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Here's the principle. 
if you want to straighten out your life, turn over a new leaf, you want to be a better person, a new you this coming 2024, 25, <laughs> you want to be a new person. Well, that's all well and good. And you want to get rid of some bad habits. You want to stop smoking, stop drinking, stop beating your wife, whatever it is you want to stop doing. I got news for you. You sweep the house and you get it nice and clean and you look good and, you know, whiten your teeth and dye your hair, whatever you got to do. If you don't fill up with the Spirit of God, you are vulnerable. You will be a vacuous mess and your life will fill with worse things than the things you gave up. Yeah, but I stopped smoking. Yeah, but you gained 300 pounds. I'm just saying. It's worse for them in the beginning. There are people who walk away from the church and they walk away from Christ with a knowledge and a base and an understanding or they think they do, but they don't have an experience. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness and having known it to turn. It says in Luke 10, 10 to 12, whatever city you enter, Jesus is telling the disciples as they go out to tell people about him and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, the very dust of your city, which clings to us, we wipe off against you. They would shake out their robes. They would kick off their shoes, make sure that they had no dust from the city. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you, that it will be more tolerable in the day of Sodom than for that city. Jesus says it's going to be worse for those who know better than those who didn't. Those who innocently were sucked into sin and got stuck in some weirdness, it's going to be better for them. So there's degrees, I believe, uh, just like there are degrees on an oven, I think there are degrees in hell. There are degrees of punishment. And those who knew better would be worse for them than it is for Sodom. It would have been better for them not to know the way of righteousness and having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. In other words, you know, you can come before Jesus and you can kind of clean up your act and behave and, in certain ways, but unless the Holy Spirit comes into you and until you give up your life to Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will never be whole in him. And you will just be a vacuous mess. You will just be this constant, uh, okay, I can't do that because it's wrong and I can't do that because it's wrong and I don't want anybody to see me. And you'll be concerned with appearance as opposed to reality. But only Jesus can change your heart and he can break the power of sin in our lives. Amen? Amen. Jesus says in... Mark 14, 21, the son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. To know the things of God, to taste of the heavenly gift, to do of all of that, to have a brush with Christ and not enter into the life of Christ is incredibly dangerous because without that, you're still hungry. Your soul is not satisfied. You're not right with God and you've stopped the worst things, but there are lots of things you do as long as it's a secret. The false teachers are that way. And it's like a dog going back to its vomit or a pig going back to roll around in the mud. So going back, guys, it doesn't look good. In fact, for Judas, it would have been better had he not been born the scripture says. Well, that's the worst news in chapter two. <laughs> chapter three, he's going to talk about the Lord coming, about the Lord Jesus coming for his people in which he is. And I believe he's on his way. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and hope you guys are enjoying our little walk through second Peter. Um, be on guard and watch out for these things. You'll be amazed at what you see.